All right, so uh, what we're going to look at in this lesson is a continuation of what we saw last time, in which we are now applying absolute value to functions and seeing what happens, especially in terms of a graph, when we find the absolute value of a function. And we introduced this idea at the end of the last lesson. So here I'm starting with a function, and this function is going to be f of x, a linear function. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, very similar to the last problem from the last lesson, is I want to sketch a graph of f of x and then understand why the sketch of the absolute value of f of x looks the way it does. So first of all, you know, if I want to look at f of x, I could go straight to the graph. It is a, you know, a linear function in which one half is the slope and negative one is the y-intercept. And we never want to forget those basics. And so I can, uh, I can graph that really easily. Uh, for example, the y-intercept is at negative one. The slope is one half, so it means up one over two. So there, there, and so on, or I can go back this way. And again, every point I picked correlates exactly with the table for x and f of x. I can just see from this table here for x and f of x, when x is negative 4, f of x is negative 3. When x is negative 2, f of x is negative 2. Negative 1, 0, 1. And if not surprisingly, I see a very simple pattern forming here because it's f of x is a linear function. And so we should always see these nice, simple linear uh, patterns forming. I'm going to grab a ruler here, sketch this function, and then talk, move on to the part that I really care about. Because right now, this is just review of math 10. OK, so this is f of x. So what about the absolute value of that? As we saw last day, I am finding the absolute value of the y values. I'm finding the absolute value of the outputs. and so. I am finding the absolute value of negative 3 when x is negative 4. And the absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. And for this next one, when x is negative 2, I'm finding the absolute value of negative 2, which is positive 2. So when x is 0, this is going to be positive 1. This is going to be 0 and just 1. R remember, the absolute value of a positive zero number is unchanged. And so let's plot these points. This is the absolute value of f of x, so negative 4 comma 3 negative 2 comma 2, 0 comma 1, 2 comma 0, and then 4 comma 1 right there. And what we see is definitely not a line, um, but it has aspects of it. And so if I look at this part here, this part I just drew, that kind of connects back to where f of x, the original line, had outputs that were negative, had y values that were negative, and then they all became positive. The other part that I'm drawing right now that is connecting to where the original function or the line or f of x had positive values, which means the absolute value did nothing. Hence, I just drew on top of it. And so there's my graph of the absolute value of f of x. And so ideally, we can fairly soon skip these tables. Maybe you are, feel like you can skip it already. Uh, the last thing I just want to mention is the domain and range of each function. And so for f of x, the domain, as with any linear function, is all real numbers. And the range, as with any linear function, is all real numbers. I can also tell by looking at the graph. If I look at the absolute value of f of x, the domain is still all real numbers. There's no number you cannot put into it. You can find the absolute value of any number. but the range is not all real numbers. The range is only positive values, or 0. And I can see that from looking at the graph. All right, so let's look at this. And this is the last example where I'll have the table. And again, we may not even need the table. Um, so like before, I have a function. I'm calling this g of x. It's a quadratic function. And I want to eventually find the absolute value of g of x. So like before. I will, since I have a quadratic function, I'm going to graph g of x first. I'll graph it in blue. And since I don't really need the table, um, I know what negative x squared plus 4 looks like. It's a quadratic function that opens down and has been translated 4 units up. So I'll draw that in blue. So 4 units up, there's my vertex. It opens down. And I can fit these as well. All right, so here's my quick graph. 
all based on us under remembering the core ideas from our quadratics unit, which I kept saying is a really important unit. Notice it keeps coming back. So here's my graph of g of x. All right, so perhaps already you can see what the graph of the absolute value of g of x looks like. However, if you're not sure, let's go back to the table of values. When x is negative 3 from looking at my graph, um, the y value is negative 5. When x is negative 2, it's 0. 3, 4 at my vertex, and then back down 3, 0, negative 5. All those coordinates there, I could just see from the graph that I plotted. And so for the absolute value of g of x, I want to find the absolute value of the outputs, or of the values I just highlighted in yellow. So the absolute value of negative 5 is positive 5. That said, the rest of these won't change until I get down to the last one, because the absolute value of 3 is 3, the absolute value of 0 is 0. Until I get to the last one, there's that negative 5 again, the absolute value of negative 5 is positive 5. So let's plot these points. Negative 3 comma positive 5, negative 2 comma 0, these are the same until I get to the last one, 3, three over and 5 up. And so again, I have a lot of points here, but remember a graph is not a bunch of points. The points kind of give me a sense about the behavior of the graph. And so the key is everything in here, my absolute value function will be an exact copy of the quadratic function. Because in that region there, all my outputs, my y values are positive and the absolute value does nothing to a positive number. As soon as my parabola goes below the x-axis, absolute value makes those outputs neg uh, positive. It changes the sign. And so it should look like a reflection. It should look like this. And you have that sort of distinctive sharp point that we tend to see a lot with these absolute value functions. And so keep in mind, in the end, I didn't really need that table. I, once, I had the, once I could visualize g of x, I could figure out which parts were not going to change and which parts would reflect. And so let's try skipping the table part and just getting straight to this. Let's try sketching the graph of the absolute value of 2x minus 3. So the first thing I want to do is visualize the graph of 2x minus 3, which again is a linear function with a slope of 2 or 2 over 1, and a y-intercept of negative 3. So I can visualize that quite nicely. A y-intercept of negative 3 means the line goes through here. And again, I'm focusing on 2x minus 3 right now, not the absolute value. And a slope of 2 means up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, or down 2 backwards 1, and so on. Now this is not h of x, so I'm going to draw this kind of lightly. I'm just going to draw this as a dashed line. Because unlike the previous questions, I'm not being asked to graph multiple things. But again, what I did graph there is most of my work. That is a graph of 2x minus 3. All right, I now want to think about the absolute value of that. And so everywhere 2x minus 3 is positive, which means everywhere the outputs are positive, which is from here onwards, this way, the absolute value will look identical. Everywhere my linear function was negative, the absolute value will reflect it up. And so at this point here, instead of being 1 down, it'll be 1 up. This being at negative 3 on the y-axis, it'll be at positive 3, and so on. And pretty quickly, I can just grab my ruler, and I can visualize this function quite nicely. So what you see in red is the graph of the absolute value of 2x minus 3. And so first, I need to figure out what am I finding the absolute value of. In this case, it was 2x minus 3. Visualize that, and then think about what changed the absolute value does that. And again, anytime my function is positive, the outputs are positive, and the absolute value does nothing. And so second last question. Same idea, though. Let me first visualize what this looks like. Now, if I look at that, all I can tell right away is it's a quadratic function with a y-intercept at 1. However, I, I want to have more detail than that. So the first thing I want to do with x squared minus 4x plus 1 is I want to put this in vertex form. And how do you do that again? By completing the square, which in this case it should be quite quick. I'm going to take the x squared minus 4x and put the plus 1 over here. I want to make a perfect square out of this. I need to take the negative 4 divided by 2 and square it. I get positive 4. 
And then to balance things out, I need to put minus 4 over here. What I have in blue is a perfect square. So what I have in blue, I can write as x minus 2 all squared. And then I have minus 3 over here. There we go. Now I'm in vertex form. And so now I can tell a lot about this function of x squared minus 4x plus 1. Because again, what you see here is just a more convenient form than what you saw at the beginning. But again, I'm still ignoring the absolute value for the time being. So this function has a vertex at 2 comma negative 3. So 2 over and 3 down. It opens up. There's no reflection. There's no stretch. So I can visualize these other points quite quickly. And again, this is the graph of the function that I'm finding the absolute value of. So again, in this case, this is the graph of y equals x squared minus 4x plus 1. Or in vertex form, x minus 2 squared minus 3. All right. So now I want to focus on, and I'll show this again in red, the absolute value of this. And so I need to look at this graph, and everywhere my graph is positive, everywhere the outputs are positive, which is all the way up here forever, and all the way up here forever. That means the absolute value function will be identical to the quadratic function. Everywhere my quadratic function is negative, which is the region I haven't dealt with yet, it will be reflected up. And so the vertex will now be right there, and the next points will be here. And it should be pretty quick. There we go. There's my graph of the absolute value of x squared minus 4x plus 1. And so in this case, you know, yeah, I had to put it in vertex form. But once we remember how to do that, it didn't have to take that long. All right. Um, so for th I will say for this particular question, um, Oh, I did forget to do some stuff. Express each in piecewise form and the domain and range. Bad me. Let me just go back up here for a second. Um, the domain and range, I'll say quite quickly. The domain and range for, again, h of x. The domain is all real numbers. The range is everything greater than or equal to 0. Again, I'm looking at function h. But in piecewise notation, this um, I should have mentioned earlier, so I apologize. Um, to put this in piecewise form, I first want to remember, and we looked at this kind of last day, uh, that I can take the equation, the absolute value of 2x minus 3, and I can write it piecewise form pretty quickly if I don't simplify it. So for example, the absolute value of 2x minus 3 equals one of two pieces, either exactly 2x minus 3 or minus 2x minus 3. And it's exactly 2x minus 3 when 2x minus 3 is greater than or equal to 0. And it's equal to minus 2x minus 3 when 2x minus 3 is less than 0. Now again, well, I'm not done yet. If anything here seems kind of strange, you need to kind of pause this and go back to the last lesson, because that's where I mentioned it in more detail. That said, this equation I could come up with pretty quickly in piecewise form. It's just needlessly messy. So, and it's all about my restrictions. This 2x minus 3 is greater than or equal to 0. OK, but I want to know in terms of just x. So I can add 3 to this quite quickly, to both of these. But after that, I have 2x. So I also want to divide both of these by 2. And remember, as long as I'm not dividing or multiplying by a negative number, I don't have to change my inequalities. So I get the same idea for both of these. So my first piece, 2x minus 3. If I add 3 to both sides, I have 2x. If I divide both sides by 2, I have just x is greater than or equal to 3 over 2. And for my other piece, which I'll just, I could distribute the negative, and sure, I'll distribute it. That'll be when x is less than 3 over 2. So that's the answer we want. And like I said, this is, I did this way too quickly if we hadn't yet seen some similar parts in the last lesson. And so, same idea for this one. I need to put this into piecewise form. And so I'll get the same setup, although this will be harder. But I'll say the absolute value of 
x squared. I can I can I'll write it in standard form here. And so again, my two pieces will be very similar to one another. One is in which x squared minus 4x plus 1 is not changed at all. One is in which it's all made to be negative, or the sign is changed. And again, we look at the first piece when x squared minus 4x plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. We look at the second piece when x squared minus 4x plus 1 is less than 0. Okay, but how do we clean up those restrictions? Well, that's what makes this a bit more challenging. If I just try to clean it up directly from this form here, um, you know, honestly, well, we have solved, this was the end of chapter of the unit three, this is the end of the quadratics unit, quadratic inequalities. But even if you remember that well, this is still gonna be challenging. Um, however, I'm really trying to realize, you know, you know, both of these, I really need to figure out when x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 0. Once I know when x squared plus four minus 4x plus 1 equals 0, then it's pretty quick for me to determine where it's greater than or less than 0. And determining where x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 0 is the same as finding its x-intercepts, which I can see roughly are right there. But they're not whole numbers, so I don't know exactly where they are. So really, most of my work is to figure out where are these x-intercepts? That tells me where x squared minus 4x plus 1 equals 0 exactly. So how do I find the x-intercepts? Well, I could try factoring x squared plus 4x plus 1. But it doesn't factor. There are no, you know, there are no two nice clean numbers that multiply to 1 but add to negative 4. So I can't factor it. So then what do we do then? Well, if we can't factor it, we can either use the quadratic formula or we can complete the square. The good thing, we've already completed the square. That's what I did right here. So it's actually not going to be that much more work than we may think, because I've already done a bunch of the work that's necessary for this. So to find those x-intercepts, I need to take that x minus 2 squared minus 3 and make it equal 0. So again, right here, I'll say find the x-intercepts. And so uh, let's take that x minus, oops, let's write that down x minus 2 squared minus 3 and make that equal to 0. OK, so to make that equal 0, add 3 to both sides. x minus 2 all squared must equal 3. Find the square root of both sides. That means x minus 2 must equal the square root of 3, but plus or minus. Add 2 to both sides. x must equal 2 plus or minus the square root of 3. So squared minus 4x plus 1, which again, notice, means the absolute value brackets are doing nothing when x is less than or equal to 2 minus root 3, or when x is greater than or equal to 2 plus root 3. And again, that goes back to my x-intercepts up there. And really, this all goes back to the end of unit 3 of our quadratics unit, which is solving quadratic inequalities. That said, the absolute value does do something when my quadratic function was between those points. It got reflected up. So I can take, just put a minus in front of the whole thing. 
I'll just leave it like this, then minus in the front. And we look at this when x is between those two x-intercepts, when x is between 2 plus or minus root 3. So I'll say when 2 is minus root 3 is less than x, which is less than 2 plus root 3. Notice, this one question, if I just look at everything, this one question requires us to have a really good sense of so much of quadratics as well as what absolute value does. That was a tough question. But notice what came into play, visualizing a quadratic function, putting it in vertex form, completing and which involved completing the square, which also involved using completing the square to find the x-intercepts, and uh, realizing how that applies to inequalities, as well as the absolute value part, and piecewise. Yeah, a tough question, but connected tons of ideas together. And again, so much of this course is interconnected back to quadratics. Here's the final problem, which honestly I think is easier than the one we just did. Um, write at least one piecewise function that represents what you see. All right, so first, um, what do I see here? Well, there's a, there's a more than one way of visualizing it, but for example, if I can see that this looks like the absolute value of a quadratic function. Now, which quadratic function? Well, there's actually two basic ways of looking at it. One is to imagine a quadratic function that looked like this and then went up here. And that's what I'm going to stick with for most of my work. But afterwards, I'll mention another way of could looked at it. So if you look at that function I just sketched out in blue, what do I have there? What is that function? That is y equals. It's a quadratic function that's opening up. That doesn't seem to have any stretch. Um, 1, 1 over up to over 4. Oh, no, there is a stretch. I take that back. I jumped to a conclusion too quickly. That's OK. I caught it. So what I can tell from this is that there is some sort of stretch. Because um, again, if there was no stretch, it would go through these points here, these points here, and it's, it's definitely not. So there is some sort of stretch taking place here. So what's the stretch? Well, I don't know yet. So let me focus on just that. Uh, let me focus on the equation of y equals a times x squared minus 5. But what's a? And again, right now I'm focusing on just that graph in blue. Well, a is my vertical stretch. I, I know it's a positive number because it's opening up, but I just don't know what it is. So how can I figure it out? It's, I can't really tell from looking at the graph so much. But again, we've also learned how we can figure this out algebraically. Because I know this graph of in blue, this graph of a times x squared minus 5, goes through several points. But the points I really like are these ones right here. I know it goes through negative 3 comma 0 and 3 comma 0. I'm just going to pick one of those. And I'm going to pick 3 comma 0. And I'm going to substitute that into my equation up here. And then I can solve for a. So I'm going to put this equation on hold for a moment. And I'm going to write it as 0 equals a times 3 squared minus 5. And now I can solve for a really quickly. I get 0 equals 9a minus 5, which means 5 equals 9a when I add 5 to both sides, which means a must equal 5 ninths. And so now I know the equation, not of the absolute value, but I know the equation of the graph in blue, is, or one part, you know, is 5 ninths x squared minus 5. And so now I can say the graph in red, because again, if I look back, this was the question I gave you. The graph in red is the absolute value of that. So now I can say the graph in red is y equals the absolute value of 5 ninths x squared minus 5 which is fantastic. However, I wanted a piecewise form function for this. So what I have here is great. It's just not in piecewise form. So how do I put it in piecewise form? Well, we've been doing this lots lately. It's not easy, at least not, ne not necessarily, but we've been doing it lots. So I can write this now as one of two pieces, one of which the absolute value brackets do nothing, one of which the absolute value brackets change the sign of the whole thing. And we look at the top piece when, again, the absolute value brackets are doing nothing because 5 over 9 x squared minus 5 is a positive number when the outputs are positive. And I don't need to do any algebraic work here. I can just look at the graph. I can see this whole region here and this whole region here. The quadratic function I, uh, that I came up with, 5 ninths x squared minus 5, is identical to the graph 
of the equation I gave you, or the function I gave you, which means the absolute value is doing nothing. So anytime x is more than 3 or less than negative 3, the absolute value is doing nothing. So I can write this as if x is less than negative 3 or more than positive 3. I'll put an or there, actually, instead of a comma. And the other piece I look at when x is between negative 3 and positive 3. I will say, you may have noticed, um, I'm always putting by convention the equal part, the greater than or equal sign ooh, I have, um, with the top equation. It doesn't really matter. You can put it either. Just don't have it on both. I mean, at that point, when x equals 3, the two equations equal one another. So it doesn't matter which one you put it on. But by convention, we put it with the positive one. There we go. So now this equation here is in piecewise form of this equation here, which creates the graph that I gave you. Oh, it's a lot of work, isn't it? Uh, and again, a tough question because it's really, again, connecting back to quadratics so much and connecting back to so many other things. Last thing I will say is that another way you could have looked at this would be, and I'll just erase this, but I recommend you don't change your notes. But another way I could have looked at this, which is just as good, and it would have been the same amount of work, is think about a quadratic function that opened up here and went down like this. And imagine the absolute value of that, which would end up looking the exact same. And your work in between would be different, but in the end, we should get the exact same piecewise form. But why take an already hard and long question even longer? So I'll leave it there.